Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all here for our third installment of our church talks. Uh, our guests tonight are uh, Joe and Amy DeWitt. They are uh, United Methodist pastors, or pastors in the United Methodist Church. Six, one, half a dozen, the other. Uh, but they'll be here tonight to sort of shed some light on, on uh, their tradition. And then, as we've done in the past, we'll have a question and answer after that. Now, uh, again, just a few words of instruction in the question and answer time. Um, one, as I've said before, just be, you know, let's all be Christians. And so, um, and then uh, we'll also, if you'll raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you since this is being broadcast and recorded so we can get the questions recorded as well, that would be, uh, that would be great. So uh, glad you're here. Looking forward to tonight. And as we begin our time together, uh, let us begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we are thankful for another opportunity to hear, Lord, of just the, of how wide the tent of the church is, God. And we thank you for these who've come, God, those who've come to listen and dialogue. Lord, we pray your blessing on this time we spend together and ask that your Holy Spirit be with us here now. In Christ's name, amen. one half of our, our duo. Um, we're a clergy couple, but we don't preach in the same church. Um, I'm the associate pastor at uh, First United Methodist Church in Anniston, and Joe is the pastor, the only pastor, of uh, Goshen United Methodist Church, uh, which is out near Piedmont. You know the Goshen area? All oh, right, okay. Um, when I was eight years old, that was when my family and I started going to church. My parents weren't raised in the church. Their parents weren't raised in the church. And there were some friends of my mom who decided that she really should take her kids to church. One of them was a black Pentecostal holiness, and the other was a United Methodist. And they equally fought for my mom to take us to their churches, and the United Methodist won, which is probably the only reason why I'm United Methodist. I equally could have been a black Pentecostal holiness person standing, <laughs> standing before you. So my mom, not having been raised in the church, uh, was kind of leery of what she wanted to sign on to when she kind of got into the church and joined the church. So she was standing one day, in the door of a Sunday school class that she had been participating with and asked the pastor of the church at the time, so, so what is this United Methodist thing all about? What are the things that I have to believe when I sign on the dotted line and become a United Methodist? And the pastor looked out over the room of about 50 people in this Sunday school class and he said, if you ask all the people in this room the same question about their faith, you'll probably get 50 different answers. In a, lot of a way, in a lot of ways, the United Methodist Church allows for interpretation and a wide diversity of expressions of faith, but some people think that you can believe whatever you want to believe and be a Methodist, and that's just kind of not true. So in the United Methodist Church, we have certain things that we hold as kind of the fundamentals of our faith. We hold to the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, but we also have something called the Articles of Religion for our denomination. And these are kind of uh, expansions of those creeds that say, when you're not United Methodist, you believe these things. We also have teaching documents. So the Articles of Religion are the things that you're going to believe. These are things like uh, what we believe about the Trinity, and what we believe about the role of the church, and what we believe about salvation. The teaching documents, on the other hand, are more about uh, things that we believe about social life. So we have a document called the Social Principles, which has developed over time, and these are things that the church teaches as a whole on anything, any social issue, from uh, abortion to planet care to uh, mental health to raising children, anything you can think of, we have like a teaching statement on that. Now, you don't have to sign on the dotted line about those social principles just to be a United Methodist, but those are the things that we, we teach. 
And if you want to know what United Methodists believe about any of those things, you can go and that's kind of what we've decided we're going to say to the world that we believe about those social issues. So we, we have doctrine that all United Methodists across the whole world believe about God and the church and discipleship and salvation. And then about social things, which we believe God is God of too, we have these teaching documents, like the social principles. Thanks. First Church, Goshen. <laughs> Y'all know them people out there. Uh, I had never heard of Goshen United Methodist Church before, and uh, I had uh, uh, grew up in North Carolina, and so uh, when I was appointed there, I was like, okay, yeah, that's great. We'll, we'll go to Goshen United Methodist Church, and then only later on did I find out, of course, the horrible string of bad luck that uh, Goshen has dealt with, particularly the pastors. As you know, it is the church that was destroyed 20 years ago uh, this past spring by a tornado uh, in which 20 people passed away, sadly. Uh, many survivors are still there. Scars are still visible. Um, and, uh, but it is an amazing thing for that church to, uh, to uh, have experienced and gone through. But uh, it is, uh, they are they're great and fantastic people, but apparently they kill their pastors really quickly. One even passed away before he got there. Uh, so I guess they decided to send a younger one just so <laughs> they'd make it. Um, Amy asked me to do a little blurb on Methodist history. So if you're a history nerd, listen up. And if not, go to sleep. Um, John and Charles Wesley, brothers, as you can imagine, ordained in the uh, Church of England, died Church of England priests. They never became... United Methodist pastors, they never separated from the Church of England, but remained for their entire lives uh, priests in the Church of England. They're preacher's kids, which is why Methodists are really messed up. And uh, they grew up in the parsonage of the Epworth Charge in England. Their father, Samuel, uh, all his life was a Church of England priest, and their mother, Susanna, had a great influence, uh, particularly on uh, John. Charles, I am almost positive that if you look through your hymnal, there will be at least one Charles Wesley hymn, if not more. Uh, he wrote over 6,000 hymns in his day, so uh, he was busy. And uh, they are some of the more widespread hymns that go quite deep in their understanding. But uh, John had a problem. He looked at the Church of England and saw a church that was kind of dead. It relied so much on uh, ritual that there was no meat to their religion, that it was just going and worshiping and sending them home. And John knew that when he re read scripture, he knew that ritual was a big part. It was worship. It was how we connect with God. But that the Church of England had forgotten or at least gotten out of the habit of connecting with one another and being and leading a holy life, not just attempting to connect with God. And so that was John's struggle. How can I be a reverent priest but also be someone who is active in serving in the world. And that's where all of our theology comes from, is what we call John's practical theology. He never sat in a, in a uh, classroom just studying theology. He always wrote on his experiences, and that's how he kind of, uh, he fleshed out his theology. And so when you, when you read something that John wrote in the early years, there's a good chance that it developed and evolved over the course of his life, uh, which is probably why we allow uh, for so much interpretation in Scripture, because our own founder, uh, his theology developed and evolved over the course of his life. Great thing about John, he was uh, baptized. Uh, the Church of England baptizes children. We do, too, in the 
United Methodist Church. He was baptized. He was raised in the church. He was a preacher's kid. He uh, went to seminary. He finished seminary. He was ordained a priest. And he still had no assurance of his own salvation until one day when he goes to a, uh, to a Bible study and hears uh, Luther's preface to the book of Romans. Now, I don't know if you've ever read Luther's preface to the book of Romans, but it's not something that should have, you know, really stirred your soul. But for some odd reason, John Wesley all of a sudden was overcome by the Holy Spirit. And he uh, wrote in his journal that he felt his heart strangely warmed. And that is what he considers his conversion moment. After he, he was an ordained priest, after he grew up in, a, in a, a pastor's home, after all of this stuff going through seminary, his conversion moment did not come until after. And so that's where our idea of, uh, we'll deal with a little more theology later, our idea of God working in our life long before we can understand or even describe who or what it is, is that God is constantly calling us to him. Uh, so John and Charles worked continuously. They started uh, what they called classes, uh, and basically it was... Okay, you have the church over here, and you're supposed to keep going. That was definite with John. You don't stop going to the church to start coming to a Methodist class. Instead, the class met some other time of the day, and you, um, you came together, and you held one another accountable. It was really, if you've ever tried small groups, it looks frighteningly like what the small group system that is really gaining a lot of traction now looks like. Um, holding one another accountable, learning scripture together, uh, just being uh, with one another as Christians who were actively striving to work in the world. John was deeply devoted to social action. He visited the prisons regularly. This was, of course, a time when uh, a prisoner only ate what his family brought him, and a prisoner could be thrown into prison simply for debt. And so Everybody in the prison was in desperate need, and so John went. He brought them food, medicine, and, of course, the gospel. Later on, uh, Methodism did jump the pond, but, of course, over here in America, we had a bit of anti-English uh, kerfuffle going on called the Revolution, and uh, they no longer wanted to be connected with the Church of England, the pastors over here. Again, John and Charles, still in England, always, 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 their entire life, Church of England priests. However, over here, Francis Asbury and Thomas Coke, bishops whom John Wesley himself ordained and sent over here, became uh, the bishops of the American church. And they formed, with other pastors in, the, uh, in this church, the, what did they call it then? The Episcopal Methodist Church. Methodist Episcopal Church. The uh, social leaning of John, the fact that we learn about God through our social interactions and through by, by paying attention to how God is speaking to us through our work in the world as Christians, remained very significant. The United Methodist Church has always been, for good or ill, on the forefront of some of the more a significant social issues of our day. It has uh, split and come back together more times than once over things like uh, slavery. That is why some Methodist churches you'll see around here are called the Methodist Episcopal Church South. If you look at their sign, they haven't changed their sign since 1968. Um, but they, uh, uh, we have split over things like you can thank our women's group, the United Methodist Women, for uh, temperance. Sorry, and you can uh, you can also uh, see all of the great work that is going on uh, through the Methodist Church as we continue to struggle with that main theme of John Wesley's practical theology. How do we live out what we read about Jesus Christ? in the Bible and what we experience about Christ in our hearts. How do we live that out in the world? What now?
Yes, ma'am. He's never this obedient at home. He's just <laughs> just in public. So. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the, our favorite words as United Methodists is grace. That's a big part of our theology because of the experience of John Wesley and because of the experience of Methodists who have come after him. Our experience is that God grants us grace throughout our lives. And uh, because John Wesley was so mm, methodical, that's the nice way to say it. He was really annoyingly like methodical about everything that he did. Um, because he's so methodical, we have names for everything. So uh, we have three different names for grace. Uh, if you ever hear these, this is what they mean. Um, we believe that God is working in our lives before we come to faith, before we know that we need God, before we even know that God exists. And we call that prevenient grace, that God is working in us, stirring us, sending us people and experiences to help us know that God's there and that God loves us. When we come to a point of faith, which we believe is, is God's doing in our lives, we believe that's the, that's the point where we're justified in the eyes of God by the uh, sal salvation, the, the saving work of Jesus. We, so we call that justifying grace, that work that helps us say yes to God's yes to us. And then we believe that, that salvation isn't just that one moment where we say yes to God and we're saved and we believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but we believe that the, that salvation moment happens throughout the rest of our lives, that throughout the rest of our lives we are continuing to grow in holiness, that we're being perfected in faith and in love, and there, there's always room for us to grow closer to God and grow in discipleship of Jesus Christ. So we call that sanctifying grace. So that uh, we're just continually being sanctified in the grace of God. Another thing that you'll hear United Methodists say a lot is uh, the word connection or connectionalism. Because we really, really like the fact that we're a connectional church. And that means that on every level, United Methodist churches are connected to each other. Not just because we are supposed to believe the same things, but, we're, but, we, but because we're in a lot of mission and organization and activity together. So the United Methodist Church as a whole is a global church. We have uh, churches on every continent, except for whatever that one is where people don't live, Antarctica. Thanks. Um, we have churches in, on every continent. So um, the United Methodist Church has, uh, has had mission from Europe and from the Americas everywhere. We're most fastly growing in South America and Africa, which is where most churches are growing the fastest. And every United Methodist Church that's here in the States is connected to those churches in Africa. We have the same like overall umbrella structure. We call that the general church. So at the general church level, um, we have a mission organization. We have organization for finance and administration. We have organization altogether for uh, higher education and ministry. So the idea behind that is that we can do more all together as a global church than we can do as any one local church. And so we send, we send missionaries as a global church. Uh, we educate people as a global church. We do a lot of things globally. Then we have like a lower level which we call the, the jurisdiction. Those are pockets of our country and pockets of other places of the world that organize together. The jurisdiction's main purpose is to consecrate and to send bishops. We have bishops. Uh, the bishops are overseers of pastors and of churches in a particular region. We call those annual conferences because those conferences meet every year. So our annual conference is North Alabama. And North Alabama United, United Methodist Churches do a lot of stuff together, too. So we're organized and connectional on that level as well. Uh, that conference is overseen by one bishop. And then I think you're going to talk about the next leg over. Next stuff. Yeah, you do that.
Okay, as if you weren't confused enough by our hierarchy. Um, so we're at the annual conference level. We got the bishops. Um, the bishops are kind of the person we answer to. We are a send system, not a call system. And so we are sent wherever we go. In the spring is the high time of Methodist anxiety where we wait for our direct supervisor called the district superintendent who uh, works with the bishop to appoint pastors to send them to different churches. Uh, we, we wait for a phone call. Uh, the, the whole idea about uh, uh, Methodist pastors going every, uh, you know, have to change every four years. You may have heard that. That used to be true. Not true anymore. The uh, actual fact is we're up every year. We could be moved any year we work. And uh, Amy and I, being pastors who have submitted to uh, the, the system by vowing we would uphold it, uh, could be appointed apart from one another. That being said, I dare the DS. Um, <clears throat> she's not big enough. Uh, but uh, um, we have accepted this simply as a, as a way of saying, okay, we've, uh, we've removed the call system from our whole idea. It's not good or bad either way, I promise you. Uh, you can find enough issues with both of them. There is politics, there's realities in the world, you know, that's the way that works. But uh, the bishop and the cabinet, all of the district superintendents who get together, uh, sit down for probably a combined three to four weeks, to whole weeks um, of uh, deep prayer, consideration of the pastor's gifts and grace, the needs that the churches have, and uh, it gets even deeper. Uh, what can this church teach this pastor to help them get to the next level over a current uh, sort of period of time? What can this pastor do with this church to help them get to the next level? The ultimate and the greatest thing would be to find where a pastor and a church fit so well that they both help one another take the next step wherever they may be. But uh, that's just kind of how we, how we process. Annual conference, like she said, is uh, North Alabama. We're in the North Alabama Annual Conference. It's basically about 15 miles south of Tuscaloosa. Draw a line straight across the state. And anything north of that, we can be moved to any United Methodist Church within that geographical area. We can move between, you know, uh, uh, between annual conferences. All it takes is a phone call between bishops. I say that like that's easy. Um, it's kind of like getting your doctors to talk together. It doesn't happen ever because they're busy. Uh, what else am I supposed to talk about here? Okay, that's, that's it. I'm done there. What are we doing now? Yeah, questions. Here, hold that. We'll just pass it back. All right, so... That was a lot of information. You all take notes? You got notes? Okay. Well, now's the time where you get to ask questions. You can ask clarifying questions, or if you've had an itch you've been wanting to scratch about United Methodist Church for a while, now's the time to do it. So, <laughs> not everybody at once. Roy Barker. <clears throat> I'm here for you guys. <laughs> I'm going to make it easy on you, Joe. Yes, sir. Amy, what time in your life did you uh, realize that you were being called into the ministry to preach? I was, I was 13 years old. Um, I had my kind of justifying moment when I was about 12. I was a part of uh, some ministry that was lay people, all lay people, not ordained folks, who uh, were witnessing and helping other people grow in their discipleship and I just felt this sense that that was what God was calling me to do for the rest of my life and I I questioned that I pushed back on it um, I thought I I don't know any girls who do that um, but there were moments throughout my life and being part of ministry where God just kind of 
qualified me and kept calling me and kept helping, uh, help me, helping me understand what my call was in life. And then at one year, when I was about to say, no, I'll find something else to do, I would love to be a social worker, uh, my pastor at my church and my district superintendent, which is that next level, and my bishop were all women, all at the same time. And that nagging feeling that you can't be a girl and do this job was kind of just taken away from me because they were all incredible women of faith and they were exciting leaders for the church. And I really felt like God was saying, you really can do this and I'm gonna help you with it. So you I was meet, really, really young. Did you meet with opposition? Not really, oh. no, I mean, there have been just incredible women. The United Methodist Church started ordaining women as elders, which is like pastors of a local church um, in 1956. Okay. So we've okay. had, you know, that. you know, more than a generation now of women who have gone before me. Good. Thanks, Roy. Who else? If they don't ask a lot of questions, feel free to ask questions of them. <laughs> I'm going to just start throwing it whoever catches it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know if you ride along, you see Congregational Methodist and United Methodist. Could you kind of distinguish between those two? Sure. <laughs> So, um, Edgewood, you know, our Congregational Methodist Church, do you, you know that church that's like up on the hill in Anniston? That's a, that's a Congregational Methodist Church. And um, they have really, do you want to talk? Okay. They have really similar theology and doctrine to us. They're part of that tradition of um, United Methodism from Wesley on. But like Joe said, the church has split and come back together in a lot of different ways. So the main difference between the United Methodist Church and the Congregational Methodist Church that you might see anywhere is that United Methodists are part of that global connectional system where we share pastors and we're part of the same mission sending organization. Congregational Methodists are kind of more like Baptist, if I could say that. I'm not really sure that's true. Um, but they're, they're more independent, so less connected to like a denomination but they do have uh, they do have associations or various uh, uh, conferences they can get involved with it but it is by choice um, along that same line what about like are the African Methodist Episcopal and Christian Methodist Episcopal is that kind of the same thing or they or they have their own bishops right sadly when I said that we were at the forefront of some of the social issues uh, and that we split and came back together, that was one of the issues where uh, we were at least halfway on the forefront and halfway not, uh, was slavery. And so half of the churches uh, rejected completely the idea of slavery uh, back in the 18, around the Civil War. And, uh, uh, but they also, uh, when they came back together, what ended up being spawned were the the African churches who said if it's taking you this long to figure out whether or not we're human beings we're going to go over here and so we ended up with the African Methodist Episcopal Church AME uh, the AME Zions and the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church as well are uh, the groups that separated at that time because well frankly we couldn't get ourselves together quickly enough to to recognize that, but you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? I think the um, AME and the AME Zion and the Christian Methodist Episcopal. I think they kind of have the same, a similar structure as the United Methodist Church in that they have bishops and their ascend system, where their pastors are are appointed to churches. Let's see somebody's hand up a minute ago. Wesleyan churches would be in that as well. Right? Wesleyan yeah. churches, um, what's Church the other? Church of the Nazarene. <clears throat> Church of the Nazarene and, and Wesleyan and um, Free Methodist. Um, are all, all of your ministerial staff at Methodist, United Methodist churches generally ordained? Or I wonder about, uh, <laughs> say for instance, uh, youth pastors and music sure. directors and that type, those type of folks. 
You know, the truth is that that's actually one thing that it de does depend on the local congregation for. So there are uh, bigger churches that will have ordained youth pastors and music directors and uh, pastors of congregational care and, and anything that you would have that are ordained. And, and some of them are lay people who um, are hired by the local church to do that particular ministry. What do you consider the major difference between the Methodist and the Baptist? <laughs> Watch it. Yeah, you'd, <laughs> you'd have to help us out with that. Um, I, I would say ecclesiology, probably, like your bishop structure. Yeah, that, that, that and, and that, you know, you baptize infants or practice yeah, that in some churches. Uh, other than that, I'd say we're pretty, pretty similar. I mean, it's, um, as, I, as I've said to you all and as i said to others, there's no such thing as Baptist theology. Like, Baptists are identified by, like, a handful of distinctives that usually revolve around polity and ecclesiology. So that's really the main difference, Oliver, is uh, you guys have bishops and we don't. And, and we have a free call system and not an appointed system. Well, and, and honestly, when it comes down to, uh, she mentioned the articles of religion, they are all extremely basic. So uh, you would have no issue whatsoever with signing on the dotted line uh, with our articles of religion. They all deal with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what is the Bible, what is salvation, what is uh, this, that, or the other, but they're all extremely basic. Everything else is up for interpretation and honestly even though it has a united methodist sign on the church uh, there are probably as many different uh, theologies within each of those churches as there are different kinds of baptist associations right. and various things like that yeah we're also non-creedal and so yeah all oh, right so we are creedal yeah, yeah no methodist. creed but the bible that was what they used to say i see somebody else with a question I'll use that old evangelist tactic. I see that hand. Yeah. <laughs> and you all look around wondering, who was it? I read years ago that uh, John Wesley's mother was converted while taking communion. Do you know anything about that? I don't know that story. I don't know that story. Well, I did, I you just may know that story. <laughs> I'm sorry? You may know that story since you brought it up. Yeah. Do, do you know the story, Bob? Well, it, well it, I read, and I don't even know where, that um, when you mentioned that he was not assured of salvation until he read Luther's, um, well, she was not assured of her salvation until she was actually taking communion. Hmm. And when she took the bread and drank the wine, the light turned on. And, and to me... That's such an encouragement to welcome everyone to come to the Lord's table. Whether that's true or not, I don't have a clue. I thought you might. <laughs> Still a good story, right? That is, a, that is a, another commonality. Uh, we, we have an open table. Anyone who uh, wishes to come may come to receive uh, communion, to receive the sacrament. Uh, it is not closed off in any way around uh, church membership, or whether or not you've even been baptized, or whether you believe. Uh, uh, we believe that even in something as sacred and powerful as communion is, um, that could be uh, what we use, that prevenient grace. It could be that God speaking into your life before you even knew that God was speaking into your life, before you could even figure it out. And so, yes, we definitely believe that uh, Holy Communion can be a significant factor in someone's life. Do you ever do baptism by immersion? Yes. Uh, we we uh, actually ascribe to and we believe in the uh, effectiveness of uh, all, all types of baptism. We specifically point out three. Um, we can do immersion, we can do pouring, or we can do, you know, the Methodist shower. And, um, but... Uh, uh, for instance, every baptism I've done so far, except for two babies, have been in a creek or a lake by full immersion. Uh, we have no issue 
with that whatsoever. So, and we even know how to fully immerse babies without causing a problem. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just in case you want to know. <laughs> just a, a Baptist fun fact. Uh, pouring is called effusion. Uh, the first Baptists were, or first, uh, you know, what we call Baptists were baptized. They baptized each. John, uh, Hel Thomas Helwes baptized himself and then baptized uh, John Smythe by effusion. So, you know, we, and then after that, we're just so tight on Duncan for some reason. Because um, it's yeah. more fun that way. It is. It's a lot more fun. Wait. <laughs> wait until it all washes off. Oh, that's Say again. We don't. Um, we can. We can. Uh, John Wesley actually said that the more you have communion, the better. He would take communion like several times a day. Um, and I think the tradition, the reason why we don't have communion every week, even every Lord's Day, um, is because when Methodism kind of jumped the pond, we didn't have a ton of pastors. And so our pastors would... would <gasps> what we called circuit riders. They would ride horses from town to town uh, and, and have church wherever they went. And so the communities that were all over the place didn't necessarily have a pastor with them, and so they didn't start out with a tradition of having Holy Communion every week. Now, generally, a lot of Methodist churches, we have it once a month on the first Sunday. That's just become our tradition. Who else has a question? Our lay is going. Um, we were we were members of a United Methodist Church in Orlando when we lived there, and I remember um, when we were in our little getting to know you Methodist initiation class, <laughs> we um, we got into a really spirited discussion about the once saved always saved part of the salvation you know doctrine and theology, and um, you know we were you talked about the open table. I mean we were a class of total converts. I mean we had the evangelicals over here and us who hadn't been to church in like. 15 years and you know just all kinds of folks in there so everybody kind of came from a different place and I actually have no recollection at all of how that conversation ended but I'm curious if um, if the United Methodist Church has a stance on that topic like church-wide or if it's just one of those kind of flexible things yeah. uh, Wesley taught that uh, backsliding is uh, possible and happens uh, if someone actively after uh, after uh, coming to uh, the realization of accepting and fully making uh, the faith their own and fully bringing Jesus into their, their life, they would have to be just as active in the opposite direction to backslide, but that does not, um, that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, hop back on the bandwagon, get yourself right again, uh, but uh, uh, Wesley did believe and teach it, but again, you know, there was that we don't actually, do we have something in the discipline about yeah, I don't know that we say whether or not, sure. we don't say anything now officially, and uh, honestly, it's kind of been personal experience, whether you can slide in or out of salvation. Uh, our salvation theology, uh, as, as she mentioned, is a life lived constantly facing towards Christ and growing towards Christ likeness. We don't believe we can just, you know, be Jesus the day we get baptized. Uh, we believe it's a it's a lifetime affair, and so we are constantly working toward uh, salvation while also having attained being justified in God's eyes. Uh, so that that leaves that question very open. Next question, Bobby Burns. Is your sermon topic your call, or is that set by the church? Hmm. That's good. Uh, every United Methodist pastor that preaches can choose to preach on whatever he or she wants. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot, of <clears throat> a lot of our pastors will follow a lectionary. Is this a, is this a thing we know? Okay, so, um, oh, you preach lectionary. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so a lot of uh, a lot of United Methodist pastors will use this very same lectionary that Chris uses 
that Episcopalians use, that Presbyterians use. Um, so, so really, you could go into a United Methodist Church at 8.30 on Sunday morning and hear a sermon on this very same scripture that, that Chris would preach on that same day. That's, that's the choice of the pastor, though. That being said, I've completely ditched the idea of the lectionary because <laughs> I, I just felt like trying to do something different. And so I'm, I'm just exercising my own uh, sermon series muscles. You, you know, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of pastors uh, going toward that. And I had never done it, and I just wanted to try it for a while. And so I've been doing sermon series just based on sometimes they're topical. Uh, based on any kind of topic right now we're we're in a series about marriage um, and uh, sometimes they're based solely upon uh, the scripture story for example we just got out of Easter I'm not going to do a sermon series over Easter that has anything to do with anything except Easter because why you know so same thing with Christmas uh, in Advent you stick with the Christmas and Advent story you don't have to really flash that one up, but other times I try to attempt to, to do a series that is more um, applied and uh, uh, practical in everyday life, and then I'll also make sure that at least once a quarter I'm throwing in there uh, stories about Jesus, because that's, that's the gospel. Other questions? Kelly Clem was pastor there at Goshen when the tornado came through. Do, do you know her, or, or where is she now? Do you know? I, I do indeed know her. Uh, she and Dale, uh, Amy and I met at Duke Divinity School in North Carolina at Duke University. I saw this kid walk in with a, a North Carolina hat. <clears throat> um, Says the guy who's wearing Carolina blue. So whatever. That's not Carolina blue. Sick em bears. What? So... Yes, uh, go figure. The Methodist, uh, one of the Methodist seminaries, mascots is a devil. But um, <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> Kelly and Dale. Yeah. Kelly and Dale were also a couple who had met at Duke, and so uh, when we moved down to North Alabama, uh, they were in Huntsville, and we got to know them. We were appointed in the same area. And uh, uh, now she is at Home Street in Huntsville, but come this June, uh, this spring, she received one of those angst-ridden phone calls, and she received one that is worse than most of them. She received one directly from the bishop that said, hey, I want you to be a district superintendent, which would make anybody run screaming into the street, uh, except, for except for Kelly, because she is amazing. Uh, but. Uh, Kelly will be the district superintendent of the uh, Northwest District, which is uh, Decatur, Florence, all of that area, basically the Northwest quarter of our uh, conference. So she'll be in any church in that area. We just had her out uh, at Goshen for our 20th anniversary of the, the tornado uh, service in remembrance. The, the Baptist, one of the Baptist universities in North Carolina, as you probably know, their mascot is the Demon Deacons. Let that say what it will about Baptist and, and they Deacons. Stink in basketball. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> I mean, come on. We, we segued into football. I thought somebody'd start talking. Now. <laughs> or sports, you know. I, I was serious. If you have a question of us, please ask it, because we want this to be is a dialogue. Chris any good? No, don't answer that. Don't answer that. They're applauding the question. Yeah. They're... We've been waiting on that phone call. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I slipped him a 20 to ask that. So. so every, I feel like every time I ever talk to Chris or I'm in the same room as Chris, he says something like, I'm not the kind of Baptist who... <laughs> and so the last time we were together, I was like, so... So no, really, why are you Baptist? No. And, um, and he, he said something about freedom. So I would, I would just ask you, like, what makes you Baptist? Why are you Baptist? Th that question, you, or that story you shared about 50 people in a room and they'd all have 50 different responses, I think everyone in here would have a different uh, response. So if you guys have time, 
Uh, no, or, I mean, but I mean, really, if somebody would like to say, so I'd like to hear, why are y'all Baptists out here? I could tell you why I am, but it'd take a while. Way he's raised. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, that's a, that's a good reason to be anything. Oh, that's the way we get Methodist, too. Faye was a Methodist, we Methodist that way. and we got her. So, <laughs> And I'm glad we do. So. Somebody else, shout out. What's a, what, give me one word. <laughs> was anybody predestined to be Baptists? Not in this church, right? Don't, don't, okay. don't bring that up. Yeah. yeah. I married a Methodist. Oh. I married a Methodist and she was just plain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I married her anyway. Yeah. <laughs> she thought she was going to be still here in this Baptist church. Right. Not being a villain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as I'm sure you all, you guys have learned by now, at least hanging out with me, um, Williams is not a typical Baptist church in this area. I mean, you guys are here tonight. So that's kind of one, one thing. But um, And you all, I don't have to tell you all that. You all know that. So, I mean, you hired me. I mean, <laughs> that's enough to tell you right there. So, uh, but, yeah, I answered that question. Uh, Brad Creed, who is the provost at Sanford and was the, the dean at the seminary I went to before I went, um, before I got there, uh, I asked him one time, I said, you know, tell me one word about what it means to be a Baptist. He said, freedom. And what he meant was, you know, you're, you know, you're free from, you're free ecclesiologically, you're free, you know, uh, we were, we're big on religious freedom, you know, Bible freedom, soul freedom, soul competency is one of our distinctives. And so I always go back to that. It's like freedom. And, I don't mean that like in a flag waving sort of way, but in like we are we are free to believe, free to practice, um, which I mean that's not to say it's unique to Baptist either, but um, but yeah. Cool. Wendell's got a question. I was uh, sitting here thinking, and, and you when you answered the last question, you uh, the about the lady at Goshen. You said she was waiting on the dreaded call, and I just wondered if the both of y'all, over the time you've been a pastor, and you you say waiting for that call, and it could come at, at any time. Have you ever left from one church to another? When someone told you to go, you, you say the bishop, and then the both of y'all talk, and you feel like you're wanting them to be moved to another church, but Jesus has a lot more for you to do at the place you're at. Do you ever get kind of torn that way? I think that in every church, there's a lot more for Jesus to do in us anyway. And so it's been our experience that that God actually works through our Episcopal system as flawed and as human as it is, God actually works through that. So God knows what churches need, and God knows what pastors need, and God knows what pastors' families need. And by and large, we are moved from one place at a good time and moved to another place at a good time for both us and for the church. And even if it's not perfect, God works through that. It's never been my experience that 
that there was a conflict between our appointment and our following the call of God. Yeah, technically, but then they're not guaranteed they're going to get a pastor at all. Because just as we are subject to what we call the itinerant system, that's the bishop moving pastors, the churches are subject to that too. So they get what they get. If they get too picky, they get a padlock on the door. That really are, happens, though. Are the individual, are, are the churches owned by the conference or by the congregation? <laughs> 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 I think it's all a legal question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. The churches are owned by uh, the United Methodist okay, Church. Okay. There is, uh, we have trustees. Uh, there is on every Methodist deed, there should be what we call the trust clause that says uh, uh, all of the buildings are, in fact, owned uh, legally by the, uh, the ultimately, uh, the, the, the one that will most work with it will be the annual conference, gotcha. but it is the United Methodist Church that owns building, grounds, parsonage. They provide for us a, a home because, well, it's only nice if they're going to move you on a regular basis yeah. that they provide a place to move you to, but um, that's how that one works. Sean, you got a question? Yeah, a friend of mine's Methodist, and <clears throat> I know that when they, they were getting a, a new pastor, he was on a group of two or three people that went to actually meet, and they were coming, they were new in town, and, and kind of just to go to their house and help them get settled in a little bit. But is you, generally, is your first exposure to the congregation the first Sunday you're there, or do you have some type of uh, period that you're exposed to the congregation that you go to? Uh, we're told about new appointments, uh, usually, um, at the end of March, beginning of April, something like that. And we are uh, supposed to meet with um, at least one committee within the church that is uh, specifically designed to work with the pastor. Uh, but there are lots of creative ways of doing that. Um, some pastors have posed as visitors and you know, pre-scouted their church and checked out their hospitality and whether or not they were very good at welcoming visitors, uh, that, that will set you right real quick. But, um, but uh, there, there are other pastors who will go and worship with a new church, especially if it's a church that's uh, doing something very different in worship. For example, if one pastor is usually only very used to traditional worship, and they're getting moved to a, a contemporary only worship kind of church, it's a good idea to go visit on a Sunday, kind of get the, the pattern of what's going on so you don't trip over yourself all that first Sunday. But yeah, that first Sunday is, is usually kind of awkward. You don't know when to stand people up and sit people down. Um, you, say, you say the, the creed or you sing, um, you sing the doxology at the wrong tempo and you know you, you just get used to that and uh, but it does give you a great insight into the idea that uh, every church is so unique um, they really are they all have their own very uh, distinctive personality and um, that's how we we kind of come to learn about that church's personality and about the vision God has for that church because we start to pick up on uh, unique characteristics of each church as we come in with a new fresh set of eyes. Any? There are some funny stories about um, about pastors moving into the parsonage, which is what we call the place where pastors live, um, and meeting the church people for the first time and like church people wanting to help them unpack their stuff. And I always want to be like, please don't go through my underwear. You know, like, let me, you can help me, like, move the heavy stuff. That's really good advice for pastors who are going to be moving in the near future. <laughs> I'm moving on. <laughs> don't yeah. go through their underwear. <laughs> but help move the heavy stuff. We'll clearly mark our boxes. <laughs> <laughs> 
there are also the nightmarish stories of uh, not so much nightmarish, uh, we can handle it, but of pastors moving in, uh, opening the back door to their U-Haul or whatever it is, and someone come running up and saying, uh, you know, Miss Daisy May just died. And uh, uh, there have been a few pastors I've known that have indeed uh, uh, done that, and then they have to, you know, leave their, their family there if they have a family. Uh, to to move in and go be a pastor immediately and then perform a funeral for someone they do not know. And, uh, my first funeral uh, was three weeks after I uh, came to a church and I had not yet met this woman because she was in a nursing home three towns over and no one even said her name in the church because, you know, I had a sight out of mind sometimes. So that was a that was an interesting time. But uh, there are some there's some interesting stories that come along with the itinerant system and moving around. Uh, we are we are furnished a place to live called the parsonage. Uh, sometimes they're even nice enough to furnish the parsonage itself so that we don't have to carry around. Uh, uh, furniture with us. Used to be, long time ago, uh, pastors would pack up the whole family and all of their belongings and head to annual conference, and which is here, is in Birmingham every year. You go there for about a week, the family goes with you, all the kids are playing out in, uh, in the yard there, wherever it may be, and at the end of annual conference you find out where you're going and the first time the church knew if they were getting a new pastor is if a different car pulled into the driveway. And uh, so that was, that was way back then. So getting a call, a call for, you know, two, three months ahead of time, we are pretty happy about. <laughs> Any final question from, from you all? All right, any final thing you'd like to say or ask of us Baptist folk? So, I mean, don't, don't let that weigh too heavy on you. Uh, just, like ultimate? <laughs> yeah, like, what is, what is the answer? I, I bet it's your experience, because it's my experience that we're, we're all Christian because we all love Jesus, and uh, that, that we are more alike than we are different. Right. Yeah, I'm hoping that's the the final outcome of this exercise we've been doing. So. I also loved to hear that uh, uh, re that not one of you said that theology is what brought you to this Baptist church. Um, it's, it, it is ultimately, when I read the gospel, it is about the relationships between other people and how God works in between them. And um, I mean, the only reason I'm Methodist is because the Methodist church in town had the best youth group, and mom and dad knew that my two older sisters and I were getting into that age. That is seriously the only reason I grew up in the Methodist church. So, uh, yes, we pastors can tend to get really stuck on theology. Forgive us, it was beaten into our heads in seminary that this is the most important thing. But uh, it's also a great thing to know that, you know, it, it's about the people. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that that is the one thing that really does connect us is, is that family in the church. Well, Amy, Joe, thanks for being here with us tonight. Thank, thank them uh, for being here. Thanks for um, having us. And I've asked our last two guests if they would to either – ask a blessing, benediction, closing prayer for us. So if you guys, sure. you can flip a coin or both of you can do it in unison. Doesn't no, matter. Do it. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, but we'll all Will stand and be dismissed. Let's pray together. Holy God, we are so thankful for the unity and the grace that you have given us to be together and to be in love of you together. We are thankful for the conversation that you have inspired and for your spirit that surrounds us. And we ask that as we go from this place, we would be reminded of your love for each and every one of us, but your love for us together as well. Go with us, and may we learn to love and to serve you 
in everything we do. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.